to the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today is the lovely and talented Jeff D. Hi, uh, host, Russell Glasser. I'm, uh, J- I'm Jeff D. As you, sa- as you said, I would be the co-host today. The co-host, That's yes. That's how that usually works. Uh, today is Sunday, August 2nd. We are a live, not public access, call-in show offering, uh, uh, let's see, <laughs> ah, I threw off my stride. We are a live call-in show uh, where we, some atheists, talk about what's on our mind, and uh, you guys, the people on the internets, uh, listen to us and call in. Uh, the Atheist Experience is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You can find out more by visiting www.atheist-community.org, and when you do that, you can also check out our FAQ page so you can see frequently asked questions that we receive on the show. The show is live on Austin Public Access Channel 16, usually uh, after the summer is over. Uh, We are live on the Internet every Sunday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, you can also watch the show live, as everybody who is watching the show live now is doing, by visiting the official Atheist Experience website, www.atheist-experience.com. You click on live stream at the top of the page, uh, and you also par- can participate in the wonderful chat room. Uh, also at the website, you will find audio and video of past episodes. You can click on Archive to find a list of programs, including links to the past episodes uh, in various media formats. You can see fan-selected clips on YouTube. Uh, And in addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. You can visit www.nonprofitsradio.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, For more information, there was an episode today, and because of our wonky schedule, there will be another episode next week on August 9th. Of this show. Of uh, non-profits. This show is every week. Uh, Non-profits. There's a show next week, right? Do you mean Uh, yesterday we had a non-profit show? Yesterday we had a non-profit. You said today. (laughs) Don't. Okay, that's what threw me off. Well, Sunday also, I, I wasn't aware that we were doing a show next week. So. I thought you... We'll okay, figure we'll it out. We'll talk about They're it later. It'll Tune in to the, the websites. websites for more details. <laughs> <laughs> Weekly meetings for the Atheist Community of Austin are hosted at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road from 1130 to 1 every Sunday, except for the first Sunday of the month when we host our lecture series at the Austin History Center located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. Earlier today, if everything went off as planned, uh, Chris Comer spoke about the state of science education in Texas, and the next lecture will be held in one month on September 13th, and I believe the speaker for that is still to be determined. If you can't make it to the morning meetings, you can always join us for dinner right after this program, beginning at around 6.30 every Sunday. Most of the people involved with the production of The Atheist Experience will head for Plucker's Wing Bar in North Austin. The address is 11066 Pecan Park Boulevard, and it's near Lakeline Mall. It's a great opportunity to meet all of us and all the people in the back, well, both of them today, um, and express your appreciation for all the hard work being done with the show. And finally, the ACA also hosts a an Atheist Happy Hour every Thursday, beginning at around 7 p.m. at the Dog and Duck Pub, located at the corner of 17th and Guadalupe. If you'd like to get in touch with us but don't feel like calling in today, you can always email us at tv at atheist-community.org. Um, we of course get more shows than we can po- get more calls than we can possibly process on every emails, show more emails than we, can we get more calls during the show oh. than we can process which is why you might want to email us we do however also get more emails than we can possibly respond that to that is for Thanks sure for pointing that out uh, so like lots of you will get replies but don't count on it um, but we love getting your emails, and uh, you know we take every opportunity to look over them, read them, uh, sometimes on the air, and learn from them. 
You have something to say? I was just going to let him know that in order to get in touch with the show, mm -hmm. we're taking calls over Skype. Right. And they need to download Skype at skype.com, set up an account, and then add Atheist TV, all one word, no spaces. When During the show, do not call that number. You won't get an answer. You need to just send a message with your name, your location, what you want to talk about, and we'll talk to you and call back. Right. Our fantastic call screener, Joe, is on the job right now taking your calls. Or somebody is. <laughs> Matt is. Uh, and uh, so anyway, you can, uh, you can Skype us. You can email us. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to get in touch with us. Uh, you can even drop into Austin and attend any one of the things that I just named. You can even try sending telepathic messages directly into our heads. Yeah. and but we'll tell if, you right now it's not going to work because yeah. there's no such thing. But if we receive them, we will notify James Randi. Right. Immediately. Yeah. Uh, and also, you can check out the uh, Atheist Experience blog, atheistexperience.blogspot.com. It's the unofficial blog of the show, but many people who are involved with the show like to write their thoughts on it occasionally. Uh, so that's another way to keep in touch. Uh, a couple of special announcements. Uh, the new ACA women's group, Dark Flow, is meeting for a happy hour on Tuesday, August 15th. And the Austin Bat Cruise is coming up real fast, and that is loads of fun every single year. So don't forget to reserve your tickets because that will be on Aug Saturday, August 29th. So visit the website and reserve your seats. Uh, that's it. Jeff? Yes, Russell. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I think last time you and I were on the show together, we were back in the studio. That is true. And it was like two months in a row. And I had one of my fits. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I took it upon myself to awkwardly calm you down. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I was um, joking. Uh, I, have, uh, I have something to talk about this week that, um, um, uh, if, if you'll allow me. Please. Last week on this show, uh, Matt and Martin got a call from Sean from Houston. Hi, Sean from Houston, if you're watching today, uh, uh, asking them to comment on something he found on x-atheist.com, uh, something called the Argument from Game Design. This is an apolog uh, apologist's attempt to justify God's authority as the source of meaning and morality and purpose and so forth, right? Uh, by analogy to game design. And, uh, and it was, hmm. it, there was a discussion on the show, and, and they did quite a good job, but I wanted to go into that in a little more detail since it especially interests me being a professional game designer. Um, the basic concept here is uh, of of this uh, argument is that the only objective purpose of a game is that which is established by its designer, and he extends <clears throat> this, uses other analogies during the course of his argument to like somebody who invents a tool, um, you know that things like that, right? Any and any person who creates a, a process or a, or a, or a, a tool or something like that, that's the guy who really knows what it's for, hmm. how it's supposed to be used, uh, what its meaning is, right? Uh, and that therefore, if there's a God who created the world, that therefore nobody else really gets a say in what the purpose and meaning of life are or what the moral rules of life are other than him as the creator. Um, let me just read you some bits of his argument. I won't go through the whole thing. This is by A.S.A. Jones, ex-atheist.com. Uh, he says, some skeptics have a difficult time understanding divine rights. Who does God think he is anyway? This argument leaves no doubt that if a biblical God exists, his declarations of morality and purpose are objective realities, while human morality and purpose can only be imaginary. 
this is the argument to use when skeptics accuse Christians of having an imaginary friend. Why? Because it exposes their own life as an, ima as an imaginative game of make-believe. Um, so it starts with this amazing little straw man. Uh, life's purpose and meaning. In an atheistic philosophy, he says, there are certain things that concern the reality of life that must be accepted as illusion because without God, that is the only thing they can be. A life that is created by chance and natural selection can have no inherent or objective purpose or meaning. Instead, such a life can only have a self-assigned subjective meaning. All right. I mean, I think that's fair enough. That's similar to what we say pretty often. So, uh, so is it that what we are saying, it, uh, we agree with that? Is right. that that's what you're saying? I, I do. How about you? Um, uh, I, 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 I want to reserve comment until I get to meatier sections of his, of his argument. Okay. He says, we may have different subjective opinions as to what that purpose is, but these are subjective opinions concerning an objective morality, right? So what he is saying is, uh, since God's the guy that created the, the game, that therefore he wrote the rules, and objectively then those are the rules. Right, well... I'm not a game designer, but I am a game player, and I disagree with his interpretation of that purely from an artistic perspective. Uh huh. Because, I mean, lots of people, e even not talking about games, lots of people take it upon themselves to uh, impo is, uh, overlay their own meaning on, say, a painting yeah. or a book and get something out of it that maybe the author didn't intend, but could still be a valid interpretation. Right. But he's saying that it's not a valid interpretation, that the right. only valid interpretation is exactly what the author or creator uh, or designer I think if that's meant, the way you view I think art... This is, this is interesting. It's this, <laughs> uh, this issue came up before when we were talking about the story that J.K. Rowling, several uh, months after the release of the last book of the Harry Potter series, revealed that uh, she had, uh, in her mind, viewed Dumbledore as a gay character all along. Hmm. And there was, a, uh, there was a Christian who responded quite similarly to this guy, saying, no, uh, or, I'm sorry, he, uh, opposite of, of this guy, excuse me, saying, no, we've all read the books, and there's nothing in there about him being gay. Doesn't matter that she wrote the books. Doesn't matter what she intended. There's nothing in the books to make him gay. Therefore, he's not gay. Remember? Yeah. Now, he wanted I to mean... Impr <laughs> to impose his own impressions on the books. I'm not sure that's a valid reinterpretation. I mean, I think there <laughs> I think there are some ways in which the author is entitled to declare the facts of her own universe. Um, although, you know, the meaning or intention is kind of up in the air. Right. Um, I mean, I, well, I, I tend to have a feeling like, write your own damn story if you want one where the wizard isn't gay. But then, but <laughs> then you're saying... Um, but, 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 uh, hmm. It is a tricky issue. Um, yeah, I uh, he the the writer of this uh, of this uh, apologetic goes on. He says, um, "God is by definition the author or designer of life. A designer designs with intention. Only the designer is in a position to know his intention." All others can speculate concerning his intention. For example, players without a set of instructions for a new board game can only have opinions as to how the game is designed to be played, right? Ooh. So now Sean pointed out that uh, a big problem with the caller, Sean, who mm -hmm. brought this up to the show in the first place last week, uh, brought up a, uh, uh, pointed out that this argument runs into a huge problem right out the, right out the door because the word objective in philosophy, according to Sean, I don't have this background, uh, 
Oh, we've got that. We've got that caller on hold, and I, I'd love to have him on after I get through some of the, my comments. Um, that uh, in philosophy, the word objective means not coming from any mind, which would include right, right. God's mind, right? The put, make, putting God in the position of, well, yeah, he can make up rules, but he has made them up subjectively by definition. Yeah. But I, I think the way that, uh, that this uh, A.S.A. Jones, who wrote The Apologetic, is trying to get around this is by, sa is by doing a um, sleight of hand. He's establishing as an objective fact that the creator is the first guy that came up with some rules, and mm, that okay. is the objective fact that he keeps referring back to. It's not necessarily an objective fact that those, therefore, are the rules of the game. They are only the rules that the guy who designed the game came up with when he did it. I see a place where this could run into trouble also. Because yep. uh, when I think about rules of a game, like uh, you know, you have the the ball can't bounce before it goes over the tennis net, for instance. Uh -huh. Those are constraints on the actions that happen, but they're not like indications of how you should play the game. Whereas when this guy talks about rules, he's talking about like I mean, I would think that a rule of reality is I can't jump up in the air and fly without some kind I, I of external think, assistance. Um, <laughs> and I I don't want to get too bogged down. I, I like that in his apologetic, he is he is in fact not stayed in the realm of game design, but right. jumped around to like, you know, he gives an example of the guy that invented a wrench didn't mean for it to be used to pound nails into a wall, even though you can <laughs> you use it You certainly can, yes. Right. Um, and I like that because I don't want to get too bogged down specifically in game design until the end, okay. uh, where, where I criticize God's game design. But um, the, the, I think what, what he's trying to do is he's trying to, ev in this argument, he does this bait and switch, and, he's, he, and it can work because people have, us human beings, have a sense of fairness and a sense of respect for creators of things. Okay. Right? Um, uh, which, uh, you know, the, this, like, fairness impulse. This person came up with this thing. Of, of course we should give that, grant some consideration to the fact that this is their invention, right? Um, but there, there is a limit to how far that goes. That... Uh, you know, that's a fine thing. Speaking as a creative person myself, I love the idea that when I design, say, a tabletop role-playing game, that people ought to be obligated to play the rules exactly precisely the way I wrote them. In fact, I may be <laughs> unique among role -play, paper role-playing game designers in wishing that that were the case. Uh, but uh, because in that hobby, those rules are widely looked upon as guidelines, advice, uh, um, and I tried to make my rules actually work. But I realize that is not the way that it is. That's not the, gonna, uh, the way it's going to be. And if I tried to impose that, people would say, well, fuck you, um, we're not buying your games yet then. We want them as a tool to do with what we will. Well, I mean, which brings up another point, which is that the point of the game is not to please the game designer. The point of the game is to give players you some You could fun. make a game where yeah. the point of the game was to please the game designer. You well, could. sure you could. You could make such would a game. It would be a very and, unpopular and, game, and, probably. And we, may, we may get to that when we get to the uh, end of this and I, ta I, I start cr uh, critiquing God's game design skills. Um, I am wearing a shirt today, just uh, since I brought up the fact that I am a game designer. This uh, is a shirt... Uh, that says, Origin, we created worlds, 1983 to 2001. Origin is the computer game company I moved down to Austin, Texas to work for. And, uh, and we created, we create worlds was the company motto because they made computer games. They were immersive virtual experiences. And uh, eventually the company got bought out and shut down by the, by the new owners. And uh, there, was a, there was a party, like a wake for the company. And, and these shirts got handed out. Um, uh, getting back to the this impulse we have to have respect for the people that design things, 
as much as I would love for that to be the case uh, for purely selfish reasons, uh, that, that because I designed a thing, therefore people have to play it my way, it's not true, and it, we certainly, that impulse is not meant to defend tyranny, right? I would be a tyrant if I made up a set of rules and said, now you will play these rule, these, this game exactly by my rules in all places at all times, right? Whether you're part of an official, like, tournament where there, you, in order to win the tournament, you've got to play the rules. I mean, in, in those cases, that, that, that's a special case, right? That's where they're judging you on your ability to play by those specific rules. But also, in your own time for fun, you must adhere only exactly to the rules as written, right? You would be a tyrant if you demanded that. Um, it's, it's not okay. So no artist or author or inventor has ever had the kind of authority over their own creations that this guy wants to uh, claim for God by virtue of God being supposedly Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of like something we always say about free speech, which is that you have the freedom to say whatever you want, but you don't have the freedom to force people to listen. But, yeah, the difference, <laughs> between, the difference between a tyrannical system, well, there, there are two main differences, and one is relevant to our discussion. A, t a tyrannical, say, government um, will, on the one hand, uh, not make exceptions. It will not have judges empowered, as we do in our legal system, judges empowered to you know, take into account special circumstances and, uh, and play a little bit loose with the rules. Mm -hmm. It won't have that, and it'll also make up new rules for you all the time, right? Uh, that, that's not exactly relevant to the discussion we're well, having. Well, sure, but I mean, the analogy here is that you can make a game with whatever rules you want, but yep. you can't force people to play your game all the time. You, and, and, and uh, though this apologetic is, in, is claiming mm -hmm. that um, if you are not playing exactly by the rules <laughs> as originally written, then... Uh, you are in violation of the objective fact that that is what the rules are by virtue of the historical fact that mm. they originally were written that way. A lot of games, you can't even find that out. We don't have an original version of, version of chess. None is known. There are zillions of pre-modern chess variants that people know about and play. And, and from what I've heard, I mean, the rules of chess certainly have changed. Like, I read about one specific case where a pawn could promote to a piece of the opposite color. Not that you'd want to, but there was, <laughs> but there was like an obscure case where that could actually help, and uh -huh. they changed that rule to make it more specific. So the rules don't, aren't just things set in stone that never change. Right. Right, uh, and especially that, that you know, and and there are a million variants of chess. People play like speed chess, or you know, different things like that. Right, and so clearly, the ch the game design analogy doesn't work. That is not the way it is in real life. Just because the fact that you are say the original cre uh, creator of a new set of rules for a new game does establish an objective fact that you are the original creator of that set of rules. But there's nothing, nothing, not in our culture, not, and certainly not in the fabric of reality, that says that there's anything at all wrong with playing it differently. There's, there's just a, not. There's no objective value judgment to be made on whether one game is better right. than another. Right, there's not. That's purely subjective. Um, I will, and, and, um, I'll say that we're, we're not just picking on the game design analogy here. This is true of wrenches. He brings it up himself, right? There is, in fact, you could build a house and you could use every tool wrong. It might be harder, but you would actually succeed in your goal of building a house by pounding in all the nails with wrenches and uh, using the edge of a scissors to screw in all screws and whatever all else you're, you're going to do. You could do it all wrong and still succeed. Um, so uh, there's that. Also, I will point out 
I, I found this especially ironic. Did you know, this is as a you know self-published uh, paper role-playing game designer, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is that game rules are not protected by law. They're completely not. There are two things, there are two uh, mechanisms in, uh, in law, in the United States, I'm talking. There's two mechanisms in place that you can, uh, that you can uh, turn to for legal protection if you're a, uh, a game designer. One is copyright. The actual text of your rules you can have a copyright on that, and if anybody makes just, you know, teeny little minor changes to the wording of your rules and pretty much reprints your copyrighted document, you're protected, right? That is a violation of your rights. The other thing you can turn to is um, patent. If you have pieces that you move around, you can patent the way, the, what those pieces are and the way you use them. You can do those two things. But you can, you can, in fact, legally take, say, Dungeons and Dragons, and people have done this. You could take Dungeons and Dragons, completely reword it, and as long as, I'm talking older editions of Dungeons and Dragons, they've gotten a little smarter and, uh, and had more prop-like, uh, patentable things, that the white, I don't know if they've actually patented uh, new editions. An actual, but, yeah. Yeah, there was an actual edition of of original Dungeons and Dragons you can find on the internet put together by guys who basically reworded everything, but it's the same damn game. Uh, another Completely actual example. Free. Uh I um down back when I was using a Palm Pilot, I was looking for games and I downloaded a game which was based on the board game Acquire. Uh-huh. It was called Acquire with a K <laughs> and a W. Right. There was a, uh, there was a similar case. And the rules case were with... identical, yep, and they yep, were handled yep. by the computer, and they didn't like write the rules, but they were in it in in every way played identical to the board game. Yeah, yeah. And it was free. Yeah. So let's. I don't want to get too sidetracked on that, but I just think it's ironic. This guy is making such a big freaking deal about the uh, the the rights and authority of the original game designer of a set of rules. When in fact, in our in American culture at least, there is no protection for that whatsoever. Um, okay, so um, God as game designer. Here's how. It, I, I just love this analogy. Now I am going to take the analogy and totally run with it and destroy it. <laughs> uh, God has invented a, a new game and he calls it Monopoly. Okay. Here's, here's what it is. You get a box. In the box, there's two six-sided dice. There's a board with a track around the outside, and the track's divided into these properties that have costs, right? And, uh, and there's little houses, and there's a track that, you, that are with little spots, clearly, for the houses to go on, where you move them up and down to show what the value of that property is. And there's all this fake money and stuff, right? And the rule of the game is, to win you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. That is like the worst game design in the history of the universe. And I'm, I'm making an analogy here now between life and monopoly. Life, being alive is this, you know, circumstance where you're surrounded by, you know, physical resources and energy sources and you, you, have, you have needs to eat and you've got a physical body and it's capable of, of certain actions and it's got various drives. And none of that, nothing in the physical world has anything to do with the supposed victory conditions. Except, I guess, in the sense that uh, you could have a slightly longer set of rules uh, written by God for the for the for the uh, real life game, where it's a list of don't do this, don't do that, don't do this other thing, right? Well, from what I hear from Christian radio, all those other things are relevant in the sense that the uh, houses and things are put there to distract you, and they're a test. <laughs> <laughs> because if you go about trying to do things with the houses and the fake money and everything, then you are, you know, then that's an obstacle to, to winning the game. But there's no, there are no actual rules for winning right. other than don't do those things, <laughs> right? It's still that you do not even have to pick up, going back to Monopoly, you don't even have to pick up the dice once. You don't even have to set up the board. You don't have to open the box if you happen to already <laughs> know what the rules are. You accept Jesus Christ as your personal saver. Bang, you're done. 
and of course it's, there's there are now variants on the rules from different uh, denominations of Christianity, right? right? There's the there's the God's monopoly variant where uh, you have to also you, uh, where uh, where uh, works count, where if you just say that but you don't like give away your play money to the other players enough, then you still don't win. Uh, you know, uh, we could go through a lot of those of those different variants. Right. Or there's the variant where some of the players it's already been decided secretly are already going to win, but they can reveal <laughs> that they're right. going to the win. Box, there's this, the, the, uh, you don't get it in the box, but somewhere elsewhere there's a list. And if you happen to be on it, you're a winner. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, terrible, terrible game design in a real, in a good game design. One of the essential elements is that the things you do in the game, right, the things that the game, the activities that the game presents you with, the choices it presents you with, are actually relevant to the victory conditions. If it's not, then you just, you know, I have in fact played some pretty bad games. There is a game um, uh, about giant monsters, Monsters Menace America. I'm now going to beat up on some poor just like game designer's game. Aww. on our show monsters menace america it's cute you pick a giant monster and there's a map of the united states and you move around and you destroy cities and you rack up points you play through all of this and once america is completely destroyed then you have a final battle to see who wins and the connection between everything that came before and the final battle is extremely tenuous can i give you one more example of yeah. a game i love to beat up on yes quidditch <laughs> Quidditch, excellent, <laughs> excellent example. Since we're talking about uh, 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 J.K. Rowling, Quidditch today. is a terrible game, and the reason is that you do all these things. You have all these players flying around to score goals. Just saw the last movie. They make it. They do a great <laughs> show of r trying to make Ron's position as a blocker look interesting, but none of it matters because if you're the seeker, you grab the golden thing and you immediately get 15 goals, which unless the other team happens to be ahead by more than 15 goals, which doesn't happen in most the, sports the, unless one team really sucks. The, the, the <laughs> concept that there's a special thing you can do to score extra points is not necessarily bad. Oh, yeah. But the that. gap between your ability to score following the normal course of the rules, right, and the special bonus points you get for the golden snitch is just ginormous. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It, the game rules of Quidditch could be, re could be improved vastly by reducing that to like, I don't know, three points. Sure. And of course, it's done because the point of the game is to make one particular fictional character yeah. score these exciting single-handed victories so yeah. you root for him. Yeah. Nobody else in the game actually matters because they're cardboard cutout characters. Sorry. Right. But now, according to... Uh, According to uh, ASA Jones, um, if anybody tried to play Quidditch in Harry Potter's world and they said, you know, let's change that so you get, I don't know, five points for capturing the Golden Snitch. Uh, five points for the Snitch. Try right? to be a much better game. No, can't be a better It doesn't matter if it's a better game. Because they are making a change on their own and are not the original designers, therefore... The entire activity becomes completely meaningless, according to this guy. I'm gonna give, I'll give you another example of a game that I loved that I played completely wrong. Do you remember Asteroids, the arcade game Asteroids? Of course, yes. You get a little spaceship, and you fly around, and there's these big asteroids, and you, you can... Uh, you can uh, turn on the thrust to make your ship go forward, and it eventually slows down, and you can turn, and you're trying to dodge the asteroids, and then you have a button to fire your little plasma bolts that hit the asteroids, score points, and break the asteroids into smaller pieces, which you also have to avoid, and they're also worth points. If you uh, if you destroy them, and you have to destroy everything to move on to the next screen, and every once in a while, there's this uh, there's this enemy spacecraft that comes out and is shooting randomly, and you don't want to get killed by that, right? That's the game. Sure. Well, I got awfully good at asteroids. They had an asteroids machine downstairs from the uh, TSR offices when I was an illustrator on Dungeons and Dragons, previously mentioned. Uh, and uh, my lunch breaks, I would go down, down, down there and play Asteroids. That is what I was doing when the news came on that Ronald Reagan had been shot, which has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> uh, I got awfully good, so I decided, what would happen? How long could I play 
if I wanted to score zero points. Because, you know, if you run into an asteroid, you score points. Of course. So the you, only way I, you're I allowed you to don't die, get points if you get shot by the UFO. Correct. So okay. the only way you can complete the game is by continuing to dodge the, the asteroids. It's all about aerobatics, right? Until, by random chance, the alien spacecraft shoots you. It's really hard. Doesn't the alien spacecraft also hit asteroids? Yes, it does. Oh, my gosh. And that, Im that increases the difficulty because it breaks up the asteroids and there's a lot more stuff you have to dodge. Okay. Um, more examples of ways that games are just not the way that Mr... Mr. Jones thinks they are. Paper role-playing games that I was talking about before. Paper role-playing games, right? B great big freaking books of rules. You can pay easily, you know, 40 bucks for a great big hardbound role-playing game these days. And it's gigantic, 100 and 250 pages in full color and all this stuff, right? There are no winning conditions in a role-playing game. There is not getting killed. That's the victory condition. And as long as you don't get killed, you, like, you know, accumulate stuff. That's what paper role-playing games are like. So, um, uh, the, uh, and actually, that's not entirely true. I have, as a player, um, I had a character who was a uh, follower of some mythological god in the fantasy setting where the game was taking place, and my character was killed, and the other player characters scraped their money together, and they went to a temple, and they paid to have me resurrected, my character resurrected. And I said, no, save your money. <laughs> my character, I'm playing, I'm role-playing here, does not want to leave Zeus's side, because he is wound up in, in, uh, in Valhalla, which is, like, supposed to be the prize and I'm playing it that way, I'll make a new character. So even not, even not getting killed is not necessarily a victory condition. Okay. It's more like, have fun. That's the point of the game. I got another one. And you get rewarded for having fun without getting killed. World of Warcraft, the uh -huh. rules specifically say that you may not uh, sell Warcraft gold for real money. Uh -huh. An entire industry has sprung up because people will pay real money for Warcraft gold. Uh, and the, the game, I guess, has become continue to make money by avoiding Blizzard's uh, authority. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, there's well, all these a meta, things meta that they game do. game that's happening yeah, I mean, there's the all original these game, but violating the yeah, expressed right. rules, the legal rules. And that, and that you right. actually have to agree to terms of service. Sure. When you play that game, it says you will not sell the in-game money, right? And yet they do. Matt brought up uh, Worlds of Warcraft on the last episode. Thank you, Matt. Um, that's a absolutely right. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, so, I guess I'm done blathering about about God and game design. The point is. A, the argument doesn't make sense for, it, for first, the reason that our, our caller, Sean, brought up, and we've got him on the line, we'll talk to him in a second, and also because it is just not true that, the, that, that life is such that there is special authority granted to the designer of a set of rules. Just not true. All that, the, that Mr. Smith would have left, uh, I'm sorry, Jones, <laughs> would have left for his argument, uh, for his apologetic, is to re re retreat to the point of, oh, well, you know, but you can't avoid the fact that God's going to impose the rules on you because, you know, he's omnipotent and can, and can make you lose if you don't do what he says. Well, fine, but that has nothing to f do with the fact that he was the original uh, designer, right? Right. It just means that he's the biggest bully. That's, that, is the, that just boils down to might makes right which ain't true, and so it loses that way. Uh, can we have, um, can we have, please, Sean on the line? Hello, Sean, are you there? Hello? Hi, Hi. Sean. Hey, I, I just thank uh, you. had for um, uh, huh? a few objections to the game designer argument that I wanted to bring up. Yeah, please. And, and before you start, I want to thank you for uh, calling in about this, because... Um, I, I really loved uh, uh, reading that thing and picking it apart myself. Yeah, it's no problem. Um, the one of the things I wanted you guys to bring up is that it doesn't that the game designer argument does not take into the account that because God is held to be eternal, 
he could not have had a cause or a reason for existing since there was no higher being with a reason or purpose for making him. And thus, by the theist's own logic, God is necessarily purposeless and random, and his purpose is subjective. Um, um, oh, that's interesting. Let me think about that a second. Yeah, well, I mean, that's actually similar to the uh, Euthyphro issue. Which right. Is, I mean, you know, is are the rules good because God made them up, or did he make them up? Well, did he write well, them that way? No, because, that's, no, that's yeah. different. What's, what Sean is pointing out is that uh, because Mr. Jones, i got to keep looking at Mr. Jones is saying that without some external source of meaning and purpose, you can't have one. That therefore God, who doesn't have an external source of meaning and purpose, can't have a sort. He can't have any meaning and purpose. Right, makes sense. I'm not sure that would necessarily. I could see one argument he could make, which is that um, I think he would. I think he would agree that, say, when I write a set of uh, rules for a board game or a computer game. I am the original designer of my set of rules. Even if I had no meaning and purpose to me doing it, I think Mr. Jones would say, well, it doesn't matter that Jeff had no meaning and purpose not believing in God. Once he had written down those, those rules, he became the author of that set of rules, and therefore you know, the rest of his argument follows. See what I'm saying? I don't think yeah, he would need but, for God to have an extra to have a purpose in order to have the authority. He's wrong, but I don't think his argument needs that. I I I don't really agree with that because okay. of the following reason. Uh, okay. They always theists always kind of suggest that without an objective purpose, everything is meaningless. So I mean, when. Wouldn't well, that yeah. still apply to God? I mean, sure. Right. I, I was just confining my response to this specific <laughs> apologetic. When you oh, widen it okay. to nothing has any meaning without without an outside objective purpose, then you're right. Then you're absolutely right. Right. And that's why when confronted with the uh, meaning question, I always like to sort of uh, shift it, if possible, to to get them to answer like, well, what is the purpose of God? Why is he there? Um, right. Because, yeah. I mean, you can reflect the exact same questions of, you know, what's your purpose if there's no God to, you know, to apply to that outer frame there. And any, any ad hoc explanations they come up with about why the God part makes sense can be brought back and, and you can apply them to the human world. Yeah, I do. I kind of I'm kind of hesitant to apply that to this guy specifically, though, because I don't know that he claims that that uh, everything needs an objective purpose to be valid. I, I don't know that he that he claims that in a way that breaks his own argument. Maybe he does, but I don't I don't know. All right. Well, I just wanted to say that there's a YouTube user by the name of Theoretical Bullshit that covers the topic of God's purposelessness very extensively and entertainingly. And I also wanted to just say one last thing. Uh, I really don't like the disrespect that's given to subjective supposed morals by theists because they say like, oh, well, if, if Hitler is killing someone and you tell him that's wrong, then it's just your opinion. Yeah. But my morality comes from my culture that went through generations of thinking and debating these morals and establishing yeah. them as laws. Yeah. And I don't think it's it's just my opinion. I mean, yeah, it's uh, backed up by I am, generations and generations of... I am so with you. It, it seems to me, I, I actually had a little rant prepared on this exact subject, because this is where this, this whole discussion goes. You're absolutely right. Um, as far as I'm concerned, theists who come at you saying that without God as ultimate lawmaker, morality is just made up and you can do whatever you want, which is what they're saying, right? Um, until they have proved that their God exists, when they say that, they are saying, in essentially, morality, are, uh, 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 morality is just made up and you can do whatever you want. They are saying no human institutions, no, um, no uh, rules that have come out of a social contract have any meaning unless their God exists, and they haven't proved that he does. Therefore, no rules that come out of human institutions and social contracts have any meaning. 
the, I mean, it's bad enough when theists go after science. But I think when they say this kind of shit, they are going after civilization. I, I totally agree with you. I, I have to say just one last thing before I go. Matt, let me uh, shamelessly plug my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to be making a few atheist videos, so I hope some people will visit. It's uh, truth at all cost with no S at the end. Uh, hopefully someone will check it out. Uh, thanks again for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I, I, I think that it, it's unbelievably irresponsible to try to knock the legs out from under social contract-based rules of behavior right? when you don't have anything else to offer. I mean, if they you, claim that they do, but they can't prove it. They freaking have to prove it. If you look at it that way, a Christian has no reason to stop at a stop sign because the Bible doesn't really say anything about stop signs specifically. Yeah. So luckily uh, most of them have this other crazy belief uh <laughs> like the the what is it the K Street people, C Street people, C Street, C Street people that we've heard about in the news lately. Yeah, and on the nonprofits yesterday. I influencing our government with their fundamentalist uh wacko craziness. Um, they most Christians buy into uh, some version of Christianity where they believe that if you have got a position of authority, you have some right to that because God must have been on your side. Right. You, and therefore, and you have the right stop to... signs are by extension an expression of God's will. <laughs> um, Luckily, but if you get caught no running a stop sign, then because you are one of those special and powerful people, then the law shouldn't apply to you. That's another that's thing where that the C believe. Street thing kicks in. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have a yeah. caller. We with have us. Jason in Maryland. Thank you, Jason. Are you there? Yeah. How's it going? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm doing all right. What's what? up? Oh, um, so what I want to talk about is, well, first of all, I'll just kind of break the ice with, what are your views on determinism versus free choice? Oh, you know what I, uh, I don't make that distinction. I am what they call a compatibilist, which is just as a point of, of interest, that is what uh, 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 Daniel Dennett, philosopher Daniel Dennett is. Mm -hmm. I believe that the physical world is uh, operates entirely within the bounds of physical law, right. but I think something perfect that we can perfectly reasonably refer to as free will that gives us all the things we would want from anything real called free will is entirely compatible with uh, with physics. Also, I think depending on what you mean by determinism, I might not agree with that either, since determinism some t is sometimes used to imply that uh, things can only have one possible outcome. And I, I think um, quantum mechanics, although it's often misused, kind of tends to negate that. Not necessarily have anything to do with free will. It doesn't have anything to do with free will because it doesn't matter whether you get your your to your right. end by rigid <laughs> physics or by dice rolling. There's an old argument that the question that is took whether place in the their profits. Th yes, yeah. There is an old episode of the nonprofits where De Dennis Lube and I have a knockdown dragout fight and I lose, which was very uh, unfortunate. Not necessarily, I, yeah. In the in the opinion of most of the listeners, I lost. No, I handled most it. Of the I handled it wrong. Who, who it was very wrote. unfortunate, but. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm willing to take my lumps. I didn't. I did not handle that work properly. Um, but the question is whether, within the bounds of the rules of nature, whether it's you know uh, uh, rigid mechanics or there's some lubrication provided by uh, quantum physics, it, whether in there somewhere there's something you can call you, and whether that thing called you can reasonably sa be said to make decisions. I think there is. Okay. Well, what I'm uh, am I there? Uh, what yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Still, listening, uh, man. Go ahead. Go on. Um, not. I'm not talking about a physical sense, and that uh, you know, people can only make one choice. My argument is that under the same conditions, if they were repeatable, a person would make the same choice every time. So what I'm saying is, my, my theory is that two things determine what decision a person makes. The first being their physical self, meaning you know, their brain composition, who they are as a person, 
and the second being their past experiences, meaning everything they've ever witnessed and the context that they uh -huh. place things in. Yeah, well, wait, wait, may, may I? I? Sure. I want to hit this exact point. Uh, no, wait. Uh, so are you saying uh, you, you've said there's, uh, there's, there's physics and then there, there's um, the question of whether the person will make the same decision again, right? I, I don't quite understand where you're coming from on that. Are you saying if the person in the exact same circumstances would make the exact same decision again, then there is free will or that then there isn't? Well, I mean, free will is a very subjective term. And yeah. I, I'm not speaking about it in a sense of free will in a, in a political okay. sense, as in I can make this choice or I can make that choice. Okay. What I'm meaning is... I, I think of it like a, like a computer with software. When you're born, the person that you are is the computer. Your machine is what you have. And then the experiences you have are sort of like the software that gets written into it. And if it was possible to repeat the same situation, like if I got up this morning and had oatmeal, yeah. if you could go back, rewind time, and I got up, I was that exact same person who had had that exact same life, I would always choose to eat oatmeal that morning. I think that and that is true, yes. I actually okay. think that it's not true. Because and that's why I because, bring up... Because of quantum physics? Yes. If it's not true, it would be because of quantum physics. I don't right. really care either way. I, I, yeah, I, I, do... I think that might be an irrelevant argument to whether or not we have free will. Uh, <clears throat> but we cert neither of us disagree with you, exactly. Okay. Well, uh, I do. <laughs> Okay. okay. So, uh, assuming with a quantum physics argument, but I guess I'm coming down to the you know the instantaneous point of time. Yeah. And I suppose you could say that you know this electron could have bounced to this state at any given time. But if we assume that I'm right, which I know Russell doesn't agree with me. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, then it's logical to come to the conclusion that from birth, you know, you know the argument: a chain of events is set forth. And since you can't control the beginning of that chain of events, yeah. you can't control your life per se. And at yeah. point, See, you that's, make that's, decision. You have that choice. That's where you, what's yeah, that? I'm sorry. I want to cut in. That is where I disagree. Okay. I don't think it is relevant to bemoan uh, not having had control of the circumstances leading up to your birth. I don't see how free will, how anything reasonable. That you could call that you would that, uh, that you would want to call free will would demand that. Why do you need to also have control of everything that happened before you came into existence? You come into existence, there you are. Now you are uh, making decisions, and as far as I'm concerned, that is where free will begins. Right. No, I'm saying that's. I'm not arguing that. I agree that that's where okay. free will begins. Okay. What I'm saying is that. Free will is a very subjective term that we assign to something. And that in reality, when you're born, once that chain of events is kicked off, you may have free will in a very you know, common sense sort of way, but you don't actually have very technical free will because I'm saying your life is set at that point. It's well, going to be what it's going to be. And even though you personally made the decisions, you know, neglecting the quantum uh, you know, physics argument. Just, just to be clear, and then I will <laughs> shut up and let Russell talk. Uh, just to be clear... Even if quantum effects had no influence and I am the result of events that came before me that determined what my initial starting conditions were going to be, and even if you could replay history and I would come out saying and doing and thinking exactly the same things, I think there is free will in a technical sense. How so? Because, what do you describe that to? Because uh, but be, I am whatever it is that I am, right? So that is my start. Those are my starting conditions. Uh, I, to say that the starting conditions would be different would be to say that I am not me. It doesn't matter that uh, if, if, um, ah, uh, gosh, um, there is no constraint on my decision making that is relevant because once I'm me, I'm making the decisions I would make, and I don't have a problem with that. Those are exactly the decisions that I wanted to make. Where is the constraint on my free will? Uh, well, it, it, so it, it's difficult because there are two very different sides of the coin. There's the side of you know, I'm a person, I feel like I'm making this choice. Of course you are making the choice. I'm not talking but, about feeling. I mean in, uh, in a practical reality. I think there's, there's free will and it's that. 
Right. Okay. Well, what if we say it this way? What if I say that people have free will, yeah. but the choices that they make, given that free will, are already determined? Yeah, that's fine. With, I, I'm fine with that. Okay. I so, do not have a problem with the idea that free will could, to an outside observer, look like, um, uh, look like we're wind-up toys. I don't right. really no, that, have a problem with that. Huh? I'm arguing that people have that people can make decisions. Yeah. People can do whatever they want to do. Yeah. But it's already set in motion, and their choices are already predetermined. I think that might be true, or it might not, depending on how much you know the outcomes are influenced by quantum events. But but the, but invoking quantum indeterminacy, while it's you know, it affects the question of whether things would play out exactly the same way. It doesn't really affect the question of free will because um, whether you got where you're going by well, random it, dice rolls or, does, or rigid mechanics it does doesn't affect, matter. It does affect the question of free will if your only argument against free will is that things happen in this deterministic way. Okay, after, I suppose. After I suppose, but that that that's not a good is, argument. It, uh, well, that's, I agree. That's okay. my point. Okay. Okay. Uh, if this is the main argument and that one gets knocked down, then you have to go and find some other argument against free will. Uh, let me recommend Daniel Dennett's book, uh, Elbow Room, Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. It's, it's like old, out of print, really hard to find, and <laughs> one of the coolest things I ever read. Check your okay. library or something. But uh, I, guess, I guess my main point is, you know, how I tie this all back into the theme of your show yeah. is that if, uh, if people believe certain things, I'm torn because on one hand I look at people who, you know, commit, uh, commit themselves to some ridiculous, obscene religion, and I say, you know, gosh, they have to be complete idiots. But on the other hand, I think of, you know, everything that I just told you, and I say, well, you know, maybe it's not their fault. Maybe they just haven't been exposed to the right things. And, you know, given different exposure and different past experiences, they might come to a better decision. And so maybe we shouldn't be angry so, and frustrated with people, but, you know, try to be as effective as possible. Yeah, but why should, wait a minute. Why shouldn't you be angry and frustrated with them? Because even if your determinism is true, it's still the case that you are, you know, the course of your life includes getting angry and frustrated and exposing more people oh, wow. to atheism. Oh, I agreed with you up until a few seconds ago. Oh, yeah? I would say, why not get angry and frustrated? Because for whatever, whatever the reasons are why that dimwit believes the things he believes, right? Those things are annoying. Those things don't make sense. Now, maybe that dimwit is someone who could be talked out of it, and, um, you know, that, that then is an argument for not being, uh, for holding off on your anger until you've sized this person up. Is this somebody who is going to be able to have sense talked into him? On the other hand, and here, I'm kind of justifying my own little rants that I go off on periodically on, on certain callers. Um, on the other hand, if you discover that they are someone who is not going to be able to see reason, then you might want to lose your temper because you might think that, well, if they're not somebody who can be have sense talked into them, maybe they're somebody who will shut the fuck up next time around and not feel like they have complete freedom to say the crazy things that they want to say without being called on it. And that is also productive. So, no, I see where you're coming from. I'm and, just and that's all true, that. even if you're both freaking wind-up toys. <laughs> right, and even if you are a wind-up toy, you're also not responsible for your reaction. No, uh, you the, I mean, are. You, no, well, of I mean, course you are. You are. If you, don't if have you are the wind-up toy that behaves that way, you right. where else would responsibility lie other than with you? Right. Okay, so we don't take uh, a person can, can, who's we don't take a person who uh, who grows up. Um, uh, uh, let's say they are beaten by their abusive father and grows up to be a serial killer. We don't let them off the hook and punish the father for being abusive. We still take the serial killer and we still do now whatever it is seems to be the treatment that is going to either protect society from them or help them recover or prefer preferably both and understanding what the true causes are is relevant so you can understand you know what the right reaction is but the fact that 
events out of their control led to them being the way they are is not relevant to the question of whether they are the person that's going to get the treatment. Right. Of no, course I understand they are. that. But uh, let, let me say one thing, and let me finish before you cut in, because I think it's yeah, going to make sorry. you angry if you don't hear the end. I get really excited uh, about this topic. <laughs> um, and the so, game design thing. It's a great day for me. I think that um, I, I, while I do come to the logical conclusion that there isn't a very technical free will, I hate the idea of it. And while I do think that, and I think that in a very technical sense, people aren't really responsible for their actions, I think we have to make them think they're responsible for their actions because if people thought they weren't, then there would be complete anarchy. So we have to operate under the assumption that people are responsible because you know, people have to be accountable for what they do. Yeah. But I think there has to be, you know, I I'm forced to sort of take a level of understanding and sort of feel sorry for people at the same time because while I think they have to be punished to set an example and to make society operate fluidly, at the same time, I have to think, is it really their fault? I, I don't. Oh, wow. I think wow. quite aside from the question of free will, it's reasonable to uh, to ask yourself what the outside influences are that affect this person's outlook on life, because it helps you deal with them more effectively. Exactly. And I and I would not say that the reason to punish someone is to set an example. I would say the reason to stop a person, possibly restrain them, possibly uh, subject them to medical treatments or whatever it is that seems like it will be most productive in protecting society from them and helping them recover. That has nothing to do with punishment exactly. I think that is an old fashioned notion that we don't really need anymore, personally. But Which... and, uh, and of course, I disagreed with that, all that other stuff you said. I think <laughs> I, I have a friend, Dennis Lube. We had that episode where there was the big debate on the nonprofits on this very subject. He also thinks, as you do, that, well, there's not really free will, but we kind of have to act like there do like like there is. And, you know, I don't think that it's necessary to uh, fall back to a position like that. A position where you are basically saying that there is something you know that you have to hide from everyone and pretend like it's not true. I think that's very unhealthy, and I also think it's not needed. I, I strongly recommend you read Dennett's book. No, well, it might be un it might not be healthy, and it might be unneeded, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. No, that doesn't. But Dennett's book will explain why it's untrue. Well, I, I don't know. In, in my view, you know, if, even if you factor in, you know, quantum uncertainty on top of, um, you know, my two things, physical self and personal experience, you know, all of that, you know, quantum uncertainty still is just chance. You're right. And, so and, I, thinking, that, and Dennis it, is not going to tell you, I, I swear, Dennis is not going to tell you that because there's quantum uncertainty, therefore there's free will. He does not make bullshit arguments like that. Well, I don't gonna, make that argument just either. A quick description of his book starts out with a chapter where he takes the various uh, arguments against free will and shows that they are made up nonsense. That, that anything we would really want to call free will is not, uh, the, 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 those arguments against it don't work. I, I, I strongly recommend you read the book. No, uh, and I think I agree I with think, you more than you think. I okay. agree with free will. I just think that it's... Um, uh, he well, says it's not an illusion. It's, it's, it's semantics. Uh, okay, well, uh, that is true because, of course, uh, one of the big issues between me and, and Dennis... Now I'm dragging this call on. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this will let you respond to what I'm about to say and then rustle and then we're done. Uh, uh, one of the reasons Dennis and I for a long time couldn't even communicate on this issue is he was going from the assumption that free will was what Christians said it was. Some kind of magical thing outside the bounds of physics that let you do stuff complete, in complete freedom uh, relative to physical reality. And uh, and I don't see why we should take on their definition, but as soon as we're making up a, a different definition for it, we're, we're playing semantics. So, okay, but what I'd like at the end of the day is not to have to feel like I'm lying to people when I tell them that I think they're responsible for their actions, right? And I'd like to get there without believing in hokum. 
Right. So. I, I would like to do that too, but I have to actually believe it. I just can't think it sounds nice. I mean, that's no different. Fair than enough. I recommend sense. Dennis' book. Russell? Okay. I'll read the book. I'll let you guys go. I'm, I'm okay. taking another piece of time. Thanks very much for your call. That's, sure. I love the free will thing. I can go on and on for hours. Let's not. Who, are, who but, do we got? Ag actually, one one other thing I would say is yeah. that bringing it back to game design, yeah. I was mentioning earlier that there are rules in, of games in the sense that there are constraints placed on people's behavior. Yeah. Uh, but that rule, those rules don't necessarily tell you how people should play. And I think similarly, there's a case to be made because some people make the case against free will that there are things you can't do and therefore you're never going to be really free. Um, right, and that's silly. the choices you make are from all the choices that are j actually available to you. Right, but it's but it's more complicated than that right. because if you were in a situation where someone was actively uh, denying various choices to you, I would agree that that is a constraint on your free will. Well, yeah. But when it's not uh, a result of someone else's an expression of someone else's will blocking yours, then I think yours is free. And right. we have Craig, Craig from California. California. Craig? Hello? Hi. Hi. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, I have an ethical, um, um, you know, um, um, point to make. Um, okay. Well, you know, you know, religion says, you know, that they're the font of morality, but, um, well, here's a simple little ethical scenario. Your friend's stuck in a burning car you have no way of finding the fire, no way of um, freeing your friend, but you have a you know a rock. Um, now, the logical and humane thing to do would be to take the rock and pounding your friend's skull and kill them quickly, rather than let them burn to death slowly. But all those people in religions, they're saying you can't do that. That's wrong. Yeah, so much for them, <laughs> uh, you know, knowing what's right. You know, it's, well, that that uh, is what you get. I, I, you know. It, yeah, scenarios like you spun right there, right? Those, I call those tragedies. There are circumstances when there's no desirable way through, right? It's a question of one horrible thing or another horrible thing. And you're weighing, you know, which is less horrible. The, the kind of morality taught in at least Christianity is is you know lists of you you should do this you mustn't do that period right and uh and no room for any kind of uh is what they used to call situational ethics right where what's actually going on matters you're right it's crazy yeah it is crazy yes yeah, I have other um, examples, but um, you probably want to get on to the next call. One example. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, th this is, sounds like one of the Peter Singer moral dilemmas. I think didn't he come up with all these scenarios? I'm, I'm not sure they were originally to him, but but there were a bunch of uh, questions that he would pose to people to explore exactly where what ideas they had about yeah. what's ethical and what's not. And one yeah. of the things that people strongly held across cultures was that. It matters if you're an active agent. It, it at least matters to people's sense of right and wrong if you're an active agent uh, causing a death rather than just uh, averting it in some way. Like, for instance, some people agreed that, say, throwing a switch that would divert a train off a track from five people to one people is okay, but, like, if you have a person sitting in a doctor's waiting room and the doctor takes the, the person uh, who believes that he's going to treat the, that guy and instead cuts him up into pieces and gives his organs to, uh, to five different people, thereby saving gonna die their lives, yeah. they didn't see that situation as morally equivalent. So, actually coming down and bashing somebody's head in with a rock... Uh, is kind of in one of those areas where it's kind of treated as icky by people, even if they can't quite and, express why. And uh, right, well, I mean, it, that, that is the that is the essence of a tragic situation, right? Oh where yeah, of course. You do, you may there can be situations where oh, just a moment. Could you I hold those up in a way? Okay, great. Um, there can be situations where the um, the better solution 
is so morally repugnant, uh, so so emotionally repugnant, I should say, that you can't bring yourself to do it. And that's that is also tragic, I think. So right. So next we have Joseph in Baton Rouge. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hi Joseph. Hi. Um love the show. I think you guys are doing a great service for uh everyone who listens to it and uh, I'm really excited. This is my first call. And I'm calling basically to talk about the C Street gang that Jeff oh, yeah. alluded to earlier. Yeah. Um, they talked about from, this a lot on the uh, the nonprofits show. Okay. I, see, I didn't get a chance to hear it yesterday. Okay. But okay. Um, I'm a history student at LSU. Mm -hmm. And one of my interests is how religion and fundamentalism kind of have been merging with politics recently. And I think this C Street gang is really a great – well – I guess I don't want to say a great example of this, but um, is a very, it's an example that worries me a lot um, when they start talking about how they're planning on building mega churches on military bases, yeah. um, how they're talking about this whole ideology of Jesus plus nothing, which is right. kind of their, um, their main ideology, um, which is kind of a totalitarian kind of thing. Um, fundamentalist. Um, yeah, I mentioned on the show kind of yesterday idea. they actually praised the mafia and Hitler as examples right, of right. people they, who they call themselves the Christian right. mafia. Right. Right. And they say that these um, these mass murderers like Hitler and Paul Pot and Stalin that they are you know actually men of God because they've been put in these places of power to. Yep execute God's will. I'm and not so sure I they guess, actually uh, said they're men of God. I think they just use them as ex as an example of people who use their power effectively, not okay. necessarily praising um, everything. Yeah, they, yeah. I guess but they, they but, do kind of compare them to the story of King David in the Bible, how right. um, he was put in this place and did terrible, terrible things, but, you know, in the end, he was God's yeah, man. If, if they you know, don't, yeah, it would be hard for them to explain, I think, how it is that Pol Pot and Hitler were not handpicked by God, given their premise. Right, you, and the, I mean, the Bible actually that. says that, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly what it, the quote can I, is. Can I take a moment and say something terrifying in defense of the C Street people? Oh, absolutely. Okay. They're terrifying enough already, so whatever you have. Um, if, if, in fact, they really believe that they really know what is really best for everyone, then they're doing exactly the right thing. Mm -hmm. they, this is why it is so important for, uh, for the, the people who feel like being activists about their atheism to... Get, start hammering now on this freaking stupid, you know, morality is whatever God says thing. That is the cause of the problem, you know? Right. If, if, uh, if it was people who really did want something that re was really best for everyone, if they were using the same kind of tactics, we could maybe quibble with their tactics. But... Mm -hmm. The, we'd go, well, you know, at least they're trying to do some good. They're not trying to do, to do some good. What they're trying to do is, um, is, you know, institute their superstitions as the law of the land. Uh, the real problem there is that not only is there, let's say, almost certainly no God, um, but people, there, there's not even a consensus on what God thinks, which means that what any individual thinks God thinks is really no more than some arbitrary thing that they personally have made up uh, that carries moral weight in their mind without the burden of trying to discuss and figure out the underlying principles behind it. Right. And so people like these C Street guys will sort of mutually tell each other, oh yeah, well you're godly, so whatever pops into your head is what you should do. Um, and yeah, that that is creepy because, I mean, you know, the reason we have societies and judges and people who sit there and consider the consequences of things is because no one person should be entrusted with making decisions for everybody. Right, right. Or, or any house full of people doing it secretly and manipulatively behind the back. Behind right. everybody's back. Yeah. Anything else, caller? Oh, oh, we moved, moved on. on. I'm Who's sorry, next? I need to see that again. We have Allison in Calgary. Hello, Allison. Hello. Hi. Hi. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Oh, hi. Um, just, just quickly, I'm told this will be quick. Um, I come from a Roman Catholic household, and I'm now an atheist, and I've used um, sort of the logistical constraint argument on my father, and so I just found a flaw in your game maker argument, and a theist can tell you that, you know, the divine doesn't have to abide by our human logistical constraints. So we can set up all these logistical arguments and constraints and say that how can God possibly exist based on what we know, but then a theist can and will say, well, they don't have, or God, sorry, does not have to abide by any of those rules. And then that's how my dad always wins these arguments against me because he says, you know, he, he is above all that. The divine is above all of our constraints. What so I just, that's just the I want to say <laughs> what he's saying then is that the rules aren't really rules because they actually have all kinds of exceptions. He's, you know, he's making a bunch of stuff up that he claims are universally true, but then he immediately contradicts himself by saying eh, they're not actually universally true because I have the freedom to make shit up that yeah. doesn't conform to the rules, which I, which also then would yeah. appear to be made yeah. up. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about the laws oh, or, or government in Canada, really. Uh, but here here in the U.S., <laughs> my response to that kind of, of, well, you know, God is in charge and he can do whatever he wants, uh, I bring up the principles of American government which is that uh, the rulers rule by the consent of the people and that there is no such thing as a guy who just unilaterally has the authority to uh, make up rules and impose them on others in, uh, in American culture. There is really no such thing. And, uh, and that is called a tyrant. Right, absolutely, and I completely agree. I've just lost this argument so many times with my father in particular because he says, you know, God does not have to abide by our political rules or our political definitions. Say, or yes, our, he, you know, say yes, he does. Just, say yes, he does. <laughs> Try that. There is a wonderful, I'm, I'm recommending books today. There is a run, wonderful <laughs> uh, novel by um, the Discworld guy, Pratchett, Terry Pratchett, and... Uh, okay. Oh, what is the who's who's the Pratchett reader here who can help me out? The book with the little turtle god? Darn. Sorry. I will find the information and post it on uh, have it posted on our website. Oh, but what there's a it's a great fantasy novel. This guy writes like uh social commentary comedy fantasy novels and it's about this priest who discovers that uh the, his god has dwindled down to like this little tortoise that can talk to him and uh and helps the tortoise regain his his <laughs> his religious power. But the cost is the god is like an elected representative of a people now. Else he's not going to get help. Okay. What I like Which to say. Fantastic. What I like to say is, how do you know that the god you're following is actually good? Because I mean, I I like to uh, invite people to imagine a scenario where uh, this guy wrote a book of rules that he said everybody should follow, and he has an enemy. But it turns out that the guy who wrote the Book of Rules is actually Satan, who's tricking everyone, and the enemy is actually right. is actually the good guy. How do you know but, that that you're? I mean, you must have some other reason other than that the God told you he was good, because Satan would right. also and tell my, you he was good. My experience um, in Canada, we don't have a, like we. I, I haven't come across a lot of fundamentalist Christians, but I was raised Catholic, right? So. Yeah. A lot of the um, the what they quote unquote know comes from dogma, and it's actually not biblical based yeah. at all. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, two it, two things. Uh, right. So it, it's and it's even that's even worse because it's a whole bunch of guys. Right. Uh, in the medieval times, trying to yeah. uh, uh, control uneducated people. Well, so, I mean, whether but it's at the same time you still have to are so ingrained, right? Uh, two but, things. Like, I remember. It's so ingrained in them. Yeah. I remember the name of the book. It's Small Gods. Small Gods, okay. And uh, and just get, getting back to that point, t yeah. Next time your dad says God doesn't have to uh, have to abide by human rules, say yeah, he does if he wants me to pay any attention to him. Otherwise, he's just a tyrant. <laughs> because what I do, you tell your dad, what I do is I have respect for elected representatives 
who are, you know, whose authority comes from the fact that people have given it to them. Tell them that. Right. Also, yeah. whether whether it's Catholicism okay. <laughs> or fundamentalism, I mean, fundamentalists don't think they're actually getting all their stuff from the Bible. I mean, a lot of this stuff about the end times that's in, like, the Left Behind books are actually from extra-biblical sources because, you know, Revelation is really a very, very short book. Uh, and there, there's been a bunch of stuff made up over the centuries to fill in the gaps of exactly what they think that uh, is going to happen that isn't coming from the Bible. Well, there's actually more books in the Catholic Bible yep, that's uh, true. than the other. Right. There's more epistles, there's more letters. So, I mean, well, how do you justify that? <laughs> like that, you know, well, people just uh, sort of sit in a committee and go, oh, that one works and that one doesn't. Uh, yep. That's that's closer right? than you think to reality because there actually was something <laughs> called the Council of Trent in like the 4th century. Right. Or am I getting the Nicaea. wrong yeah. Nicaea, yeah. Council of Trent was later. <laughs> the Nicene Council... There were there were actually a bunch of books that didn't make it into the Bible, and the reason that they didn't was because a committee sat around and said, okay, that one stays, that one goes. They, they cobbled together the Bible based on the stuff they already believed. Well, thanks very much for your call. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and take care. Thank you very much. All right, bye-bye. Thanks. Okay, bye. So next, we're going to have Darren from Toronto. We're going to close out the show with a whole bunch of Canadian callers, apparently. We probably have one time for one more after this. But hello, Darren. Are you there? Darren. Hello, Darren. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, I'm there. How are you guys doing? Good. Fine. You? I'm just, uh, first of all, I want to make a really quick comment about uh, the video game thing. I'm not going to go on about it. Just had one quick thing. Uh, a lot of the success on some of the most recent games are actually uh, specifically based on their ability to have user own content and stuff like that, like sandbox games and that sort of thing. Perfect Ooh, example would be Grand yeah. Theft Auto, where can, people jump out of airplanes and land in pools. Can, uh, I, and can, I, can, I, can I go a little bit further with that point? Uh, this is something I forgot to mention when I was doing my thing. Uh, another thing that is uh, a highly uh, respected achievement, if you can... If you can uh, uh, if you can come up with it in a computer game, is a game that has multiple possible uh, uh, endings, right? Multiple ways to win. And, and it, it, like, uh, what was it, Grand Theft Auto you were just talking about? There's different ways yeah. to achieve the goal, and, and if there are a po possible different winning goals, that's also considered great game design, because it's really hard. But a god should yeah, be able another, to do it. Another perfect example of that might be Mass Effect, where you can actually win by doing the opposite of the goal, and you win both times, whether you slaughter the people or whether you save them, you still win, and you get to do it both ways. Or uh, Spore is a good example, because it also, uh, I mean, you know, you have all these different alien civilizations, and you can sort of conquer the universe by killing all of them, or you can make them all your friends and join up into one mass civilization. Which I mean, is, there's, there's multiple ways. Which is, you know, in uh, 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 to be honest, that's more like real life. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> or actually, to be more, the most real, like real life is probably enslaving them through economic debt. But anyway, <laughs> which is another way to win spore. Which is. Uh, sorry, yeah, that wasn't actually really what good. I called about. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, I've been listening to your show for a little while now. And um, <laughs> my understanding of it being in there in Austin is that... Uh, it's kind of the polar opposite to where I am, which is in Toronto, which is um, the last time I heard the numbers where it was the most multicultural city in the world. We have about 54% of our population here uh, has been living here less than four years, as in from another country. Um, and part and parcel with that is um, obviously the big religious mixture. Mm. Um, and I've been reading a lot of Sam Harris recently and his Letter to a Christian Nation book um, kind of really identified one point with me, which is the kind of... Um, Apology, not as an apologist, as a Christian, apo Christian apologist, but um, the apology nature of kind of liberals and, oh, you know, that whole just society of just like, oh, well, you know, we don't want to talk about their beliefs because there's so many of them. We're very, very good here at just saying, oh, well, I'm not, I don't even want to know what you believe. It doesn't matter. Anything you believe is fine. Uh, and I think that we live in a bit of a bubble. And I'm starting to feel very, as I kind of wake up to this issue, starting to feel very threatened here in a weird way because of the freedom because um i think you know every time i've ever come up and, and mentioned you know against anyone's belief it's you know i could be talking to someone who is 
doesn't go to church. They're really Christian in the loosest possible sense of the word. And I could be talking about a Hindu or a Muslim or anybody else, or vice versa, to a Muslim but a Christian, and they will jump all down my throat about somebody else's religion and stuff and say I'm not even allowed. And I'm like, I didn't even get to first base, and this isn't even something that you believe. And I just thought that'd be, that would be that sounds like kind of an opposite in a way to what you know is you guys experience down there. Well, Austin is the most liberal and multicultural part of Texas. Um, but that's so, like saying, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's relative. Well, you know, compared with everything else in Texas, compared it's with relatively everything else, yes. tolerable, but not as far as what it, it's not as extreme as what you're discussing. I mean, I, so I don't know. Are you looking for advice? Uh, not so much advice, do? just I wanted to put it on the map as like another example of what's kind of going on in the world, because if anything, it actually might be more difficult, because my understanding of what it can be like in, you know, states or and anywhere else, anywhere else where there's kind of I'm, a large majority of one religion is that you at least have like the, the small cowering in a cave group of people who don't <laughs> agree, and, you know, right. uh, and at least and here it's like everybody will kill you for talking about anything. There's uh, no even with even among the atheists and free thinkers and and, still and very... the religionists will freaking take advantage of that. I think you are correct to be uh, somewhat concerned. Mm -hmm. I think there's two different mindsets to be worried about. One of them is the my religion is right and everybody else must be silenced and beaten down, which is typical of the fundamentalist Christians. And then there's the uh, you know, the, the equally offended people who say, uh, we, we can't talk about anyone's religion. Uh, you know, we, we get a lot of email that says, like, you know, you guys are just as fundamentalist and closed-minded as those other people. How can you criticize anyone's religion? I think neither is correct. I think everybody should be free to believe what they want, and we should be free to call it stupid. I mean... You know, I think that's all just part of the same free speech fabric that I value. Right. Because because then what you get is a discussion where the ground rules have to be, um, you know, reality and reason. And and uh, ultimately we'll win if those are the ground rules. But even if we don't win, uh, at least we'll be relatively safer as long as those are the ground yeah. rules. I mean, anyway, thanks for taking my call, guys. I just, you know, the, the one thing that's funny up here is that people will yell at you or get mad at you for, for saying something about, you know, even even the issue of religion before they even know which religion you're trashing. And, and that's the thing yeah. that gets me upset. Yeah. But anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Yep. Okay. Thanks for your call. Well, it would seem that that's our show. That's all the callers that we have time for today. And uh, I want to thank everybody on the Internet for tuning in. We can't really have a sense of how many people there are sitting over here, but... It's been getting pretty big, and uh, thanks for being here today, Jeff. It's Thank been you. a pleasure as always. I had a good old time. Year. Always disappointed when we don't get crazy Christians calling, but... I know. What's up with them? They can't handle Skype, apparently. Right. <laughs>